Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Welcome, I'm Shannon. I'll be leading us through our service today. And whether you're new to our community, this online experience, or if you've worshiped with us many times before, I want you to know we're really glad you're here. We want to encourage you to worship together with others. We have community groups meeting together virtually as we worship today. If you're not in a group, we also have a public group you can join, and our host will share a link in the chat window. As we worship together today, there will be words in bold on the screen that we invite you to say along with us. We recognize it can feel weird to speak or sing in our rooms on our own, but I want you to invite you to push through the awkwardness as we worship God together in word and song. Let us prepare our hearts to worship together. O oh Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Give us the joy of your saving help and sustain us with your life-giving spirit. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, one God who was, and who is, and who is to come, the Almighty. Alleluia. Please sing with us.
has done great things we will say together we will feast and weep no more we will feast and weep no more amen thank you jesus
thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love. It's so big that the oceans couldn't even hold it. The galaxies couldn't hold it. Lord, as we move through this week, as we move through the rest of this service, would you be present? And would you fill our hearts with your love? We pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. As we continue to worship, we'll do so through confession. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. I invite you to take a physical posture that reflects a posture of humility in your heart. You might sit or kneel. Together, let's open our hearts before God, turn away from sin, and turn to Christ. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Take comfort in these words from the Apostle John. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Knowing that Jesus lifts us up out of our sin, receive these words of assurance. Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive us our sins, open our eyes to God's truth, strengthen us to do God's will, and give us the joy of his kingdom through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, the gospel is good news of great joy. Let's rejoice together. All the earth, shout and sing for joy, for great in your midst is the Holy One. Alleluia. Our scripture reading today is Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Their thrones for judgment are set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, welcome. My name is Alistair. I'm the lead pastor of St. Peter's Fireside. And wherever you are today, we're really glad you're joining with us. If you've joined us for our online service before, you probably noticed that things look pretty different around us, and we're really excited about it. The Church of the Naz generously let us make a temporary studio in their basement. But studio might be too generous. Let me paint a picture for you. We built two walls in a very colorful youth room. And you might be wondering, well, why did we do this? And I just want to give you uh, a quick rationale behind this decision. Uh, we did it because being online for services is going to last much longer than we originally anticipated. When we first started filming our service for broadcast to keep people connected, we threw something together as quickly as we could. And we're really proud of what our team has done. But as we've thought about having this service go on for an extended period of time, it gave us a chance to say, what could be done better and what do we need to keep doing this week after week for the foreseeable future? So first, one of the reasons we want to start filming in a studio is because it allows us to decrease our production time, which also then saves time for staff to focus on other things throughout the week. Having a dedicated space lets us keep certain things set up, and we've also made a small investment uh, into some equipment that will also ultimately help decrease how long it takes to film 
and edit these services for you. Uh, second, this space allows us to improve production. Uh, we have more control, especially over sound in a smaller room than we had in the large sanctuary. And so in the future, we're hoping to have more musicians uh, be a part of the service, and we think this will be a benefit to the church. Uh, third, it's also a factor of safety for staff. Uh, the sanctuary upstairs is a common space. There are many people going in and out of it, but this room is dedicated for us. So as we continue to implement social distance measures and keep uh, the safety of our staff in mind, this space allows us to better serve our staff that way. Uh, finally, we made these changes because we recognize uh, that our online service is the new front door of our church. That for many people, this is how they're going to encounter us for the first time. And so we wanted to think through an aesthetic that represents our history of being creative and design sensitive. And we wanted to create an environment that best welcomes someone from a visually driven generation. And so we hope that helps you understand why we've made this shift. We're going to keep playing around uh, with different settings and lighting over the weeks to come until we find something that feels uh, most comfortable for all of us. Uh, lastly, I want to thank Rob Collis, our pastoral apprentice, uh, for his hard work on this project. He put this whole thing together. We're really grateful his, for his creativity and his energy. I want to thank Derek Martin and Heidi Martin for uh, helping build the studio, as well as Joseph Chung and Ken Jarvis, uh, who also helped put everything together. And of of course, we want to thank Church of the Naz for their generosity and letting us use this youth room in the basement of their church. We are grateful. And so let's pray uh, before we dig into God's word. And let's also pray and give thanks uh, for this opportunity to have this space. Father, we do give you thanks that although we are scattered throughout the city, we can be together uh, digitally, virtually in this moment. We thank you, Lord, for Church of the Naz and ask that you would continue to bless them and provide for them. Thank you for how they share their space with us and how they're letting us use this dedicated space uh, to put together our services so that we can serve our church and ultimately create opportunities for people to discover your goodness. As we open your word, we ask that you'd apply it to our minds, that we not grow shallow, that you'd apply it to our hearts, that we not grow cold, and that you'd apply it to our feet. Do we not just be hearers of your word, but doers also. We pray all of these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I remember when the first webcam was released, the quick cam in 1995. It was this white orb cradled in a pyramid. It felt like something mythical descended out of outer space or something that the Illuminati had concocted. But either way, I got to hook this thing up to my clunky desktop computer with its giant monitor and I was awestruck as I could take photos and they would appear on my screen immediately. And then as internet speeds improved over the years, we could start having video conferences and it was just incredible. It was like the Jetsons come true. I also remember when Wi-Fi started being available on flights. In fact, one of my friends was on the first flight in the United States that had Wi-Fi for the first time. And he says it started uh, with an announcement. And everyone oohed and awed and took out their devices and connected to the Wi-Fi. But after about 10 minutes, the system crashed. And the guy sitting beside him started grumbling and complaining, Oh, I can't believe this. This is terrible. How inconvenient. And my friend said it just struck him that this person could be so upset about a technology he didn't even know existed 10 minutes earlier. We relate to our technology. It can be awe-inspiring and it can be frustrating. Our webcams and Wi-Fi, they can connect us but also cause disconnection. And now these two technologies especially have become ingredients for us to worship together as a church. You know, worshiping together has always been an essential mark of what it means to be the church. And we're grateful that these technologies have allowed us to stay connected during this pandemic. But it's also not the same, is it? And if we're honest, it's pretty frustrating at times. Because all this connection can also foster a sense of disconnection. 
So today I wanna to consider how our technology relates to this essential mark of the church and how we should relate to this technology as it becomes a part of our worship experience. To begin, I wanna look at the opening two verses of Psalm 122. Here's what the psalmist writes. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. So let's first root ourselves in the context. This is the third psalm of a collection of psalms called a song of ascent. Essentially, Psalms 120 through 134 are pilgrim songs. They describe a journey from a long way away into the very heart of God. And so we can imagine people singing these psalms, reciting these psalms as they traveled from their home, wherever it was, however far it may be, to the capital, Jerusalem, into the temple and into the very presence of God. These were the psalms that tracked their journey. And there were three major festivals every year that gave them opportunity to make this pilgrimage. But it wasn't likely that the average person could do this three times a year. It may not have even happened every year. For some people, this would be a, a singular and life-changing pilgrimage. For others, it might happen once a year, every couple of years, but no matter how frequent someone could do this, no, no matter how often they could get to Jerusalem for a festival to worship with God's people, Whenever they could do it, it was significant. The opening of Psalm 122 describes the elation of arrival. The pilgrims have arrived in Jerusalem and they're standing within her gates. And now they're preparing to go to the house of the Lord. They're preparing to go to the temple. And the psalmist says it made him glad, which might feel like a little bit of an understatement. It can also be translated, I rejoiced. So there's this deep, heartfelt, visible joy at the thought of going with other pilgrims into the temple to worship God. You see, this is not about some sightseeing excitement. You know, this isn't about traveling abroad to see some incredible wonders of the world. Yes, we might go see the pyramids in Egypt or South America and feel a sense of awe, but that's not what is driving this pilgrimage. These pilgrims might be Feeling awe when they see the temple, it was magnificent, but there was something more going on. And here's what we need to understand. In ancient Judaism, the temple where was the place where God most fully dwells. This was the physical place on earth where heaven intersected with earth. And the phrase, the house of the Lord, just doesn't do it justice. The psalmist literally says, we are going to Yahweh's house. He uses God's personal name, the name God revealed to Moses, the name we often translate as the Lord. We're going to Yahweh's house. Think about what it's like to enter the home of someone you love, maybe a friend or a parent or a grandparent. And think about what it's like to enter that home after you haven't been there for a while. The sensations, the, the smell of a place, the sights, the decorations, the warmth. I can still vividly remember what it was like to visit my grandmother's apartment. She had this huge collection of spoons across her walls. And beside her favorite armchair was this strange, lifelike, green stuffed dog that I just loved that my sister somehow got in the inheritance, but hey, I'm over it. And I remember the smell of cigarette smoke and an incredibly clean apartment. And I remember that my grandmother would always sneak a piece of candy into my hand while my mom wasn't watching. We know the joy of what it is to enter into the home of someone we love because they matter to us. But it's not just the familiarity of the home that causes us joy. It's the fact that we are with the person. Let's go to Yahweh's house. Let's go into the home of God. Of course, the psalmist is glad. Of course, the psalmist is filled with joy. He's about to be with God in God's very presence. 
See, the, pre the temple was the place where every little detail mattered. Everything you saw, every sight, every smell was meant to move your attention beyond this world heavenward. The temple was the place where God dwells, the place where his presence was palpable, where he could be met. Now, as followers of Jesus, as people walking on the pilgrimage that Christ has paved for us, we can still relate to this psalm, but we need to acknowledge a significant change. We no longer embark on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to visit the temple. Because that is not where God is found anymore. And we can't say that some beautiful cathedral or meeting space or makeshift studio is the one-for-one -one equivalent, that this is the new temple. Because scripture reveals that God's heart was never really for having a temple, that God's concern was not about setting up brick and mortar so that he could have a home on earth where he could kick back and relax and have some visitors. As Stephen says in his speech in Acts 7, verse 48 through 50, God does not dwell in houses made by hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make these things? Instead, God's desire has always been to be with his people, to be at home with his people. And this is why the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? So because of what Jesus accomplished in his death and resurrection, we are now God's temple. We are the place where God is pleased to be found. We are the place that the Spirit resides. And so if you think about what the temple meant to ancient Israel, this is a huge claim. You are the temple of God. The Spirit of God doesn't reside in brick and mortar in this impressive building as important as it had been to Paul's Jewish identity. He's making a revolutionary claim. The church, God's people, you are now the temple. Christ's spirit, because he's ascended and sent the promised spirit, now dwells in you. This means that no cathedral, no building, no meeting space, no church really matters in the big picture. The church, the people of God, Wherever and however they gather, that's what matters to God. That's God's temple. That is the place where you find the Spirit of God dwelling richly. And so when you gather alongside other people, even just a few people who follow Jesus with you, it's like stepping into the temple where heaven intersects with earth, where God makes his home and dwelling and his presence is felt and known. When you look, at the followers of Jesus that you know, do you behold this great mystery? When you look into the eyes of another believer, do you realize you're gazing upon God's temple, the place where his spirit dwells and vice versa? It's amazing. It's incredible. No wonder we should be filled with gladness and joy as we prepare to enter the temple and worship God together. This is especially good news for us to remember during a time such as this. Because like most churches throughout the world right now, we're not able to gather in a physical place. We now meet virtually, online. And if the church isn't a building, what is the problem then with replacing a physical space with a virtual space? Webcams and Wi-Fi and whatnot. Now, to be clear, there were actually some immediate benefits to this shift. Although it was an unwelcome change, we saw some immediate benefits. When services went online back in March, most churches around North America started enthusiastically reporting more engagement within their community. 
So they would look at the view counts and the analytics. And when you took the math and said for every viewer, that's actually probably 1.5 people. Churches were concluded more people are actually engaging our service now that it's online than when we were having gatherings in person. And there were articles written, people saying, this is exciting. This is amazing. What a great opportunity to reach more people. And I have to admit, as a pastor, it was a strange experience. Because the first time in a long time, week after week, I didn't have to be on on a Sunday in the same way. I could be at home with my wife and kids, engage a service with all of you, worship God, and just be present to that experience in a different way. And it seemed to really impact Julia too. Week after week, I would look over and I would see that tears were in her eyes. It seemed that she was able to give her heart and undivided attention to the worship in a different way. It was really encouraging. And so I thought to myself, God is moving in her life and my life in such powerful ways, but not so fast. Week after week, Julia was crying as she puts it, because it doesn't feel right. She wasn't having a profound spiritual encounter. She was lamenting and mourning. This doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right to worship in our homes. It doesn't feel right to be apart from you all, webcams and Wi-Fi and whatnot. It doesn't feel right. Virtual is not the same is physical. You know, if the psalmist rejoiced in going to the temple, how can we rejoice in going to the temple? Because the temple isn't a building, it's people. But people don't feel the same digitally, do they? And I have to admit, as this experience has been prolonged, as it's gone on longer than anticipated, I've found it very hard to preach through a camera to you. It doesn't feel the same. Church online is not the same. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I'm incredibly grateful for this technology. I'm grateful that we are able to remain connected, even if it's not the same, even if this technology comes with challenges. It's necessary and we're doing what we can with it. And I'm proud of our team, but it's not the same because for all this connection, it also fosters a sense of disconnection too. The virtual connection emphasizes the physical disconnection. And the more we're online, the more we become aware that we are not truly present in the ways we once were. And I know Julia and I are not the only ones feeling this way because I've spoken with many of you. And recently, a study conducted by the Barna Group in the United States found that over the past few months, online engagement for churches is dropping drastically. And this has been true for us and other churches in Vancouver too. Now, some of this might be explainable by the usual summer dip. For us, as soon as May comes around, we watch attendance drop until September. And this happens every year. It's a part of the rhythm of, of living in Vancouver. People want to be outside when the weather's good. They're going on vacation. It makes sense. But this year, it's hard to know if that's what's going on or if there's something else going on. And when I've talked to many of you, it seems like there's more going on than just our usual summer pattern. I've had multiple conversations with people in our community and with a bit of embarrass embarrassment, almost a bit sheepishly, after a bit of time, they say, hey, I have to tell you something. I haven't really been engaging consistently with the services on Sunday. And perhaps this is true for you. Your engagement is inconsistent or spotty at best, or maybe you've stopped altogether and now someone shared this sermon with you because I would like you to share this sermon with people that you know aren't present because I think the message is important. But I want you to hear me say this, especially if you've been disengaged from Sunday worship. We understand. It's okay. We don't want you to feel guilty or ashamed about that. Now, normally... If everything was as it was, I would start to feel concerned when we see people uh, uh, start fading away from engagement in Sunday worship. And I worry about that because it can be a symptom of many things. It, and you start wondering, well, what's going on? Why aren't they here? How are they doing in their faith? And, and what could be going on in their formation? 
Now, if that's why you're disengaging, we are concerned about that. And we do care about that. And we want to make sure you're getting the care you need. But we need you to reach out to us because we don't know as well in this new environment. But if that's not the case, if you're disengaging from online worship because the virtual experience for you is just fostering a deeper sense of disconnection and it's painful or you just don't like it. It's okay. We understand. We know this isn't ideal. There's limits to what technology can and can't do. And so you, if you've disengaged in this past season, you need to know it is no indictment against your faith. You don't need to feel guilty or ashamed. We're figuring this out together and there is ample grace to be found. But the difficult news, the difficult news is that we're not going to be returning to what things once were anytime soon. So I want to consider how can we reclaim the gladness and the joy that God's people can experience when we get to gather together during this time when we're meeting primarily through virtual means rather than physical places. First, first, we need to resist this gravitational pull toward individualism. If you've disengaged from the online service, one temptation that is definitely going to creep up is individualism. Let's look at the opening verses of Psalm 122 once more. Look at how this ancient psalmist approached community. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I, the individual, was glad when they, the godly friends, said to me, the individual, let us, now he and they are us, a united community, go to the house of the Lord. And let's consider what Paul said to the church in Corinth again. Do you, plural, not know that you, plural, are God's temple and that the spirit of God dwells in you, plural. Paul's using a divine y'all. So it's not that we all just have individual portions of the spirit. Of course, the spirit dwells in you individually. But Paul is saying there is something about the body of Christ, the temple of Christ, the people of God being together in which that is how the spirit dwells among us. In these verses, gladness and joy and excitement are connected to gathering with others to worship God together. And so we need others to flourish in our faith. And it doesn't have to be a large gathering. Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. And although Jesus is talking about how his spirit is present when a few people make difficult decisions about unrepentant sin for the health of the church. I think there is an implication to this verse. Two or three people are enough. This is true for difficult decisions, and it's true for communal worship too. So Jesus plus me alone isn't the equation God has for us to flourish. Jesus plus me plus his body plus others that's God's design for us to flourish, for us to become the people he dreams of us being. And so, yes, we can go to Christ on our own. Yes, we can experience the Spirit's power on our own. And we need that. We need our own personal disciplines of withdrawing to be with Christ, whether through scripture or through prayer or gratitude or thanksgiving or fasting or whatever other things you may need to foster that connection to Christ in your day-to-day -day life. And we need spiritual practices and disciplines of gathering with other followers so we can be nourished that way as well and so that we can experience the spirit in the unique way in which he dwells in all his people. One is not complete without the other. Personal devotion, community, they go hand in hand. And this is why Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, let the person who until now has had the privilege of living a common Christian life with other Christians praise God's grace from the bottom of their heart. And St. Augustine, we rejoice when we find companions in this pilgrimage. 
And so for this reason, we want to resist the pull toward individualism and just charting out faith on our own. We want to resist the logic and the math of me plus Jesus is all I need because that is not what Christ taught and it's not what God has for us. And while it's understandable that some of us are disengaging from online services, I want to ask all of you to keep a close eye on this tug towards individualism. Virtual isn't ideal, but it remains necessary because it's one way that we can continue to gather together to worship God. Second, let's reject cynicism and cultivate thankfulness. I know it's easy to be cynical about the online worship experience. And if you're honest about church in general, you know, we're people full of ideals and expectations. We can say, you know, the online service, it was better in the sanctuary. No, I like it better in the studio. Oh, it should have more liturgy. No, I think it should have less liturgy. There should be more music. There should be chanting. There should be contemporary songs. No, there should be hymns, a sloppy wet kiss. No, an unforeseen kiss. That's a nerdy joke for people who know contemporary worship music. We're not expressive enough. No, it's too charismatic. The preaching should have more stories. No, the preaching should be more expository and so on. And we can get cynical about what's being done when it doesn't align with our own ideals and expectations that are often very good ideals and expectations. And it's easy to pick apart a church and name its shortcomings. And when we step back and we see all this tension, we can just get cynical about the tension, can't we? But here's one thing we can all agree on. I should never have bangs. I questioned reality after I saw that video. I thought, in what world did I go out and think that that looked okay? In what world does my wife not stop me? In what world does Parker let me film with that? And when I saw it come up on the service, I turned to Julian and said, I can't watch this. I can't see anything other than these bangs. So let me say, if you're questioning my trustworthiness and my judgment, I am too. So if you're just wondering what is Alistair talking about, go two weeks back, watch this sermon, and you'll see, yeah, Alistair, bad decision. I know, I repent. So we can agree on some things. We can agree Alistair should not have bangs. We can agree on that much. But let's be honest, I've only named the surface level cynicism with the church. I haven't touched on matters of greater importance. Like what's the tension between preaching and social mercy? What's the tension between engaging politics and resistance? What, how do we know if we're caring enough for the marginalized and the poor and caring well enough for the well-being of our members? There's lots of reasons we can look at the church and see it falling short and start to feel cynical about the people of God. But cynicism toward the church on matters small, and great, it's never going to help us. Even if we can understand why cynicism can grow in our hearts toward the bride, I think we can all relate, you know, to St. Augustine who said the church is a whore, but she's also my mother. We get that tension, but cynicism isn't going to help us. And I want us to reject cynicism because it can either cause disconnection because what we ultimately do is write off the church altogether and we withdraw and we do it on our own or we give up. Or cynicism draws us toward others who share our cynical perspective. But what we end up doing is fueling bitterness and resentment and discontent and we actually malform one another. So being cynical, it might be celebrated and commended by culture, but it is never encouraged by God. It is not a fruit of the Spirit. So I want to invite all of us, and I'm preaching to myself at this point, to reject cynicism and cultivate thankfulness. To reject cynicism and cultivate thankfulness. Virtual services, they're not ideal. There's much to critique about them but they are what we have for this season. And once again, consider what Dietrich Bonhoeffer has to say. The physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the believer. How can God entrust great things to the one who will not thankfully receive from him the little things? If we do not give thanks daily for the Christian fellowship in which we've been placed, even where there is no great experience, no discoverable riches, but much weakness, small faith, and difficulty. 
If on the contrary, we only keep complaining to God that everything is so paltry and petty, so far from what we expected, then we hinder God from letting our fellowship grow according to the measure and riches which are there for all of us in Jesus Christ. Now, to be fair, Bonhoeffer wrote these words well before the invention of the internet. He had no conception of webcams and Wi-Fi. The concept of attending church online or maintaining and developing relationships through various technologies was not even on his mind. But I think what he says still applies even in a virtual space. We need the presence of other Christians, even if it's a digital presence for the time being. And we too can cultivate thankfulness even when there is no great experience, no discoverable riches, but much weakness, small faith, and difficulty. And although it's a far cry from what we would prefer, we can be thankful for one another's digital presence in our lives, for this virtual space when physical presence is no longer possible. So perhaps by rejecting cynicism and cultivating thankfulness, we will see the re restoration of our ability to feel glad and rejoice when we gather with other Christians, even if it is in a virtual way. And I want us to resist individualism. I want us to reject cynicism. I want to see us cultivate thankfulness in the hope that God will restore this joy of worshiping together, even though it looks different for the time being. St. Pete's, we still need to prioritize gathering to worship together. This has always been an essential mark of the church. And so whether that's virtually on Sunday at one of our broadcast times or gathering with a small group of people to engage the service together, we need to prioritize this spiritual discipline. It matters. And even though we might not feel glad like the psalmist, even though it might be hard to rejoice in gathering this way, I want to invite you to pursue thankfulness that during this pandemic, we actually have the technology to remain connected. If this happened 50 years ago, 100 years ago when it did, these sort of opportunities simply did not exist. And so it's a gift of grace. And how we're going to engage is going to look different. But our desire of, of our leadership team, of our staff, my desire is to see us remain connected because our connection to a local body of Christ is of the utmost importance. And so I want to encourage you to read the letter that Preston uh, sent out this week that's also available on our website at stpf.ca slash blog because there he helpfully outlines some of the different ways and the different resources we're providing for you to be connected at this time. So please check that out. And however we may do this, let's not lose sight of the bigger pilgrimage because we are on a pilgrimage. We're following the path that Jesus blazed for us and he's blazed the trail to a new Jerusalem, a new city, a new heavens and earth, a new creation where his spirit dwells fully. And on the way, on this pilgrimage, we get signs and glimpses and tastes of this kingdom to come even now. But the scriptures are unashamed. This is no easy journey. It comes with difficulties and challenges. So thanks be to God that he provides other pilgrims to walk this path with us. So may the spirit of Christ strengthen you through your relationship with other pilgrims so that you might truly see the temple of God and his spirit at work in us. Let's pray. After each petition, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and you can respond at home with, hear our prayer. Lord, as we talk about being connected and disconnected, it stirs a lot in us. And we long to be connected to you and to one another. And Lord, we long for your table. It has been a long time since we gathered at your table to be nourished by your presence in the bread and the wine, your body and your blood. Lord, as we long for you this way, we give you thanks that you truly do dwell in us through faith. 
And so, Lord, meet us in that desire for the sacrament of communion and stir within us your spirit and the assurance that you will never leave or forsake us. Keep us united by your power, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church, both St. Peter's Fireside and the church at large, to reject individualism, to resist the temptation of Jesus and me, that's enough. Lord, cultivate in us interdependence upon one another and help us find ways to press into that interdependence in this season. Lord, help us to reject cynicism, which runs so deep in our culture, which is so easy to accept as just part of how we see the world. Instead, Lord, cultivate thankfulness in us. Teach us how to give thanks in things small and big. And Lord, would you restore to us the joy of salvation, restore to us the gladness of gathering to be with your people, whether it's virtual or physical. And Lord, we lament the difference. We acknowledge it, that it's hard, but we ask for that same gladness, that same joy to be present as we worship by the power of your spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, we pray you would sustain your church throughout the world, especially in Beirut. We pray for Marwin Abul Zeloff, the planting pastor of City Bible Church in Beirut. Lord, you know they were the closest church to the blast, only a quarter mile away, and that their building sustained massive structural damage, a building that their own community's hands built. Lord, they, their pastor said the people here feel forgotten, they feel cursed because Lebanon in the recent months have been ravaged. Oh Lord, would you meet your people in Beirut? And would they be a signpost of hope for the people of Lebanon? And would you provide for your people and for Lebanon? Would you restore what's been lost? Would you mend so much brokenness? And Lord, would you pour your spirit upon your temple in that place? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And as our Savior's taught us, we're bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. As our service comes to a close, I'd like to share a few announcements with you. If you want to learn more about who we are as a church, or are looking to get more connected, then St. Pete's 101 is for you. 101 is the primer to St. Peter's Fireside. It's a chance to discover who we are and what we're all about as a church. Meet one of our pastors and figure out your next steps in our community. If you're watching this on Sunday morning, our next session is today at 1 p.m. with Alistair. You can sign up at stpf.ca slash events. Our 2020 survey is now live. This year's survey focuses on your experiences during COVID-19. We want to know how you're doing and hear your thoughts about St. Peter's reopening in the future. Participating in this survey helps our community grow healthier and look more and more like the church Jesus calls us to be. Whether you're visiting, have only joined us online, or call St. Peter's home, please take the survey at survey.stpf.ca. As you know, we are constantly adapting to the reality of COVID-19. As we prepare for the fall, 
we have been adjusting our strategy and plans for our community. An update from our pastor, Preston Gordon, is now available at stpf.ca slash blog. Preston addresses our fall strategy for Sunday services, community groups, and maintaining strong connections with one another. It's more than we can cover here, so please take the time to read this important update. Finally, I want to encourage you to continue the conversation. Take another 15 minutes in your community group to pray and discuss the service. If you're not in a group, you can join the public group, which our host will post in the chat window. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, that his ways may be known on earth and his saving power throughout every nation. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in God's peace to love and serve our city. Amen.